I have with me, uh, I would say, a wonderful guest, somebody who has been at the forefront of policy making in India. Over the past three months, I have been conversing with diverse sect of people from politics, from thought leaders. And today, I am extremely delighted. And I stress that I'm delighted because this is my 14th conversation. And I have with me uh, Dr. Arvind Panakriya. He needs no introduction. He is the former vice chairman of Niti Aayog. He is a professor at Columbia University. He is an author who has written a very, very famous book, which everybody is talking about, India Unlimited, uh, Reclaiming the Lost Glory. It's a pleasure to have you, sir, in this conversation. And I hope you are keeping safe during the time of COVID. Very happy to be with you, Pradeep. And <laughs> yes, you know, uh, if, if you stay home, then you're safe from COVID. Uh, and which is what my wife and I are doing, uh, you know, we've been pretty much for the last, uh, since mid-March, we, we've been going out very, very sparingly. Absolutely. Let me begin this interview, sir. And let me begin by quoting few uh, data. Uh, on uh, 14th April 2020, the IMF said that the Indian growth rate will be 1.9%. Moody's have projected that the Indian GDP will shrink to 3.1%. SNP says that India will contract by 5% in 2021. But Fitch had come up with a report saying that it predicts 9.5% growth rate in 2021 2022. Now, India has come up with a 20 lakh uh, 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 crore uh, economic package. I will go into the details of that later. But I want your response, uh, 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 Dr. Panakriya, that how do you look at different rating agencies looking at the Indian growth rate differently? And what is your short term and medium term projection? And what is it based on? What should we look at the Indian economy going forward? Yeah. So, Pradeep, I have steadfastly maintained that the uncertainty associated with COVID uh, is so large uh, that uh, any predictions uh, are sort of possible depending on how you feel. Uh, will uh, the advance of COVID or, or uh, its, its uh, uh, regression will proceed? Uh, so I, I, I don't therefore try to predict what will happen this year. Uh, 2021, uh, anything is possible, you know, uh, and, and since uh, we are still, uh, what, in the, um, uh, so this April, April, May, June, so we're still in the first quarter of 2021. Yes. Uh, so, you know, if things work out extremely well, in the second half, we might actually begin to see growth. It's possible you can't rule it out. Uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, Fitch may turn out to be right as well uh, if uh, uh, the current trends uh, in um, the advance of COVID continue in places like Delhi and Bombay, which are our hubs of economic activity. Uh, so I wouldn't hazard a guess, you know, uh, uh, for this year, 2021, uh, even for 2022, I think things will look good in any case, you know, purely arithmetically. Because if there is a decline in the GDP in, in the current year 2021, then you're calculating the growth rate over that lower base. Uh, and so therefore, even if you are returning to the old growth, uh, old GDP, meaning pre-COVID GDP, uh, uh, that would mean a huge growth. So, yes. so growth rate, meaning in terms of the growth rate. Yes. Yeah. So, so Dr. So, Kanabir, sorry to interject you, and I want to just dwell a bit further on this before going to the topic which everybody wants your opinion on. Uh, Dr. Panagri, I'm absolutely in consonance with you that we are living in a zone of unpredictability. But uh, on 24th March 2020, Dr. Panagri, you said that India may suffer a huge co uh, economic cost if COVID lasts for more than six months. And uh, you, at the same time, are extremely bullish. That's uh, where you say that India has a chance of became, becoming a $7 trillion economy by 2030. I was going through your interviews. I researched a lot. So my question to you, Dr. Panagriya, is that at this moment, we are staring in uh, June, uh, uh, end of June. Are you bullish about the next year? Or are you cautious about the next year? Or are you pessimist about the next year? Uh, again, uh, I mean, I, 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 my nature is to be optimistic. Uh, so, so in that sense, you know, I, I would, uh, if you make me choose between bearish and bullish, I'll choose bullish. Uh, but uh, again, you know, it'd be good to see another quarter or so pass because 
I think uh, by September or October, we'll get a good sense of what is happening with the vaccines. Uh, you know, if the vaccine comes through, uh, yeah. that will really make me very bullish on in, in uh, 21, 22. Um, I think the government has responded well. And as you said, we will come to that. Uh, but uh, 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 it is also, I mean, in terms of just not the 20 lakh uh, crore package, but it has announced a, a large number of reforms. Uh, and if that is an indication of what the government's intention is going forward as well, then I think the future is quite bright because uh, uh, there are a few more things that the government needs to do uh, for which it has the mandate, it has the votes. Uh, uh, it's just a matter of whether it has inclination or not. Uh, uh, so that also would become clear as we go forward. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Panagia, let me tell you that this interview is getting a huge amount of traction and we are talking late at night live. Yes. And people are honored to have your opinion. Uh, Dr. Panagia, I want to straight go to the mood point on which people want your opinion on. And that is on India's relationship with China economically. Yeah. Now, uh, let me give a context to this for my viewers. Now, there is a uh, uh, Dr. Panagria. I have been traveling across the country. Like last year, I traveled 400 constituencies to predict the Indian elections on television. This time in COVID, I have traveled 20,000 kilometers, 11 states. And the public sentiment which I gather, Dr. Panagria, uh, is twofold. One is that people are largely with the government in the way it has handled COVID, at least till now. But at the same time, Dr. Panagria, there is a massive sentiment on the ground against China. And uh, this is, uh, I would say, to an extent of loath, uh, loath, not just desisting China, but loathing China. But when I look at the reality, Dr. Panagri, I find that in 2018-19, we have a $53 billion trade deficit with China. This is definitely less than what we had in 2017-18. But over the past few years, even though the rate of trade deficit has come down, but we have seen a disproportionate trade deficit between India and China. Now, I want to understand, Dr. Panakriya, that uh, boycott China, uh, uh, is that a reality? How should we look at the India-China economic relations with the public sentiment on the ground being against China? And even diplomatically across, you would see that there is a global isolation of China, at least I would say, a temporarily, which is taking place. I want your wholesome perspective on China. Okay. <laughs> This is obviously, uh, as as you already outlined, the very complex question. Yes. So let's let's unpack it one by one. Sure. So first, for a moment, keep the conflict issue out. Okay. Uh, I want to deal with this bilateral deficit issue uh, because that issue off and on comes through uh, in the public policy debate, even when there is no conflict with China. Right. So so that's an independent an issue which ought to be independently assessed. So my first point here is that, look, you know, in general, it doesn't make sense for us to get worried about the bilateral deficit. Uh, overall, we need to worry about the current account deficit, uh, 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 which is largely, you know, deficit on uh, uh, merchandise and services trade account with some some entries modification uh, is, is required. But, you know, largely current account deficit. So that's something we need to worry about because that's what determines that has an impact on our exchange rate uh, uh, and uh, it impacts our debt that we are accumulating or decumulating abroad. Uh, so that's that's something we ought to worry about overall current account deficit. Now, bilaterally, what we, what we ought to always do, uh, conflict aside to which I'll come, uh, is, is buy the goods that we need to buy, goods that we don't produce, from the cheapest source that is available around the world. Sure. Uh, that could be China, that could be Malaysia, it could be Indonesia. And for different products, these could be different countries. First, now, likewise, when we have some extra goods that we are not going to use and we are going to export, uh, we should sell those products to the countries that give us the highest price. So if US gives us the highest price, we sell, we should sell them. If European Union gives us the highest price, we should sell them and so forth. So uh, uh, and in this process, there is no guarantee that, you know, you will balance the trade across countries because the suppliers of cheaper goods that you want uh, may be very different than the buyers of, the, uh, uh, of, of, of high price uh, buyers who would give you the higher prices on your goods. So bilaterally, 
the the simple example i use is that look you know as a household uh, what do i do i run a very large surplus with columbia university because i give sell them my services they pay me my salary uh, so i have a huge surplus uh, uh, with with uh, uh, columbia university and then i have deficit with everybody else you know i go buy at amazon so i have a big deficit with amazon uh, these days uh, i go uh, uh, buy furniture somewhere uh, then i have a deficit there and so you know there is no reason and it would be foolish for me to try to bilaterally balance uh, with 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 uh, columbia you know i mean what am i going to buy from columbia at, 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 i mean only thing they sell is 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 education but but i am a provider not now any more the recipient of education uh and likewise you know uh, what will amazon pay me if i mean you know what can i sell to amazon so amazon is only going to sell me so that's the the the, the reason i don't get exercised by bilateral uh, uh, surplus or deficit as long as we keep an eye on the overall current account deficit uh, because that's what you know it's like my own budget so sure. if i start spending too much more than my income which is yeah. equivalent of the deficit on the current account then i accumulate debt how am i going to pay that debt so that's a bit worrisome so so that's something i need to worry about now we can bring in the conflict issue so this is how i see it and uh, uh, tomorrow or, or on on thursday uh, uh, there is a piece in the times of india that should be coming out which lays out this argument in greater detail so i i've been thinking so luckily because of because i was writing and i always do a lot of thinking before i write uh, i did a lot of thinking on you know how how i want to approach this issue of conflict and the trade sanctions issue and and here in the end this is where i come out that look you know why is china treating us the way it is treating right now meaning why is it becoming this hostile country on our border why are these incursions happening i think the only explanation i think which which will survive uh, is that china over the years has become larger and larger and larger and you know once it crossed the 10 trillion dollar mark it became very confident that uh, that it can now begin to pursue its uh, uh, geopolitical and strategic objectives and so it's not just us but you can look at south china sea you can look at east china i mean you know the uh, 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 side of the ocean and so forth everywhere china is you know so it wants to be the regional power it wants to be the regional hegemon and as a part of that it wants to acquire strategic lands and our borders etc question i ask myself is if today india was a tri- 10 trillion dollar economy so near equal of china maybe 14 and 10 you know that's fine it's a little difference but if you are a 10 trillion dollar economy uh and therefore commensurately equally powerful military also will china their challenges on the border and my answer is that no i think then china would think three times the reason it actually comes to us it bothers us today is that it sees us that look you know there are less than 3 trillion i am 14 trillion now china is today 14 trillion which is more than four times the indian size and commensurately the military is larger and so forth so it says oh, this is my time to acquire this territory that i seek so that is the context with which i come on the economic side now what should be my objective well i have to defend my territories today and as we go forward i have to do that but my objective also has to be build a 10 trillion dollar economy as fast as i can that is what i need to do and this is where i then when i think about the trade side of it should i be opening another trade war with china would it help me right if it helps me of course i should do that but will it will it help me and and think about about this now there is this large deficit but for we are we are forgetting the size right i mean so we think that we can inflict a very large injury on china because china exports so much to us and we export so little to china so figures that i have 2018 are china exporting us about 79 billion dollars worth of goods india exporting maybe about 19 or so billion dollars worth of goods in 2018 uh, that's roughly the figure now the trouble is that 
China is a big exporter, huge yes. exporter. So Chinese exports to us are only 3.1% of its total exports. Yes. Our exports to China truly are smaller, only 19, as I said, 19 billion. But they are about 5.8% of our, our total exports because we ex our total exports are much smaller than China's. Yes. So once you correct it for the size, our ability to inflict big injury on China through trade sanctions is not quite as large as we might think. And certainly relative terms, you know, it's equal or in fact, you know, if you look at the proportions, then then in fact, China has uh, more power in that sense, you know, 5.8% of our, of our exports are going to China. So that's first thing that can I really inflict a major injury on China through that, right? And, and there I see that, you know, at the end of the day, their ability and our ability plus uh, uh, are certainly matched if, if, China, if, if not uh, worse than that. Plus now, when I ask myself that, well, what about the injury to myself from the sanctions that I impose? Now, you know, we fashionable view is that China exports it to us finished manufacturers and we send to China only raw materials and minerals. Some truth in that, but there is also the truth that a lot of the raw materials and components that we need in pharmaceuticals, we got the raw materials. In, uh, compon in, in uh, auto industry, we need components. They're coming from China. When I start, you know, doing this kind of generalized kind of uh, 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 trade sanctions against China, my industries will suffer. Now, that suffering, particularly in the current context, becomes much more problematic because, first of all, I came into COVID with a very stressed financial sector. Was already very, very weak. Yes. And that got reflected in my 4.2% growth. Gro growth in 1920 has plummeted to just 4.2%. Yes. Prior to that, we were growing at 7.5%. Yes. So that has happened. Then COVID has hit me on top. Mm -hmm. So my demand has been uh, uh, very much uh, uh, shocked. My supply side has also been shocked. Mm. Or do I want to pile up more shocks to it by imposing the uh, trade sanctions? Yeah. Okay. And, and so this is where, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Panagri, uh, you absolutely uh, laid a very wholesome perspective to it. Uh, but uh, my question to you, uh, Dr. Panagri, and the perspective to this uh, uh, question is that uh, till now, uh, at least say uh, since post-independence, we have grown our economy in a non-aligned foreign policy there. As foreign policy, we thought that it is better to be non-aligned. And in that realm, we tried to grow our foreign policy. We did not get very close to either of the uh, world powers. And that is what we at least uh, maintained. And this was the Nehruvian concept. But now in a liberalized world, uh, uh, Dr. Panagria, where you clearly see there is a big trust deficit between two major powers, that is the United States of America and China. Now, with China opening another front, as you said, because it is a uh, $14 trillion economy and it needs to achieve its strategic objective. But the worry is that it is achieving its strategic objective, not being a democracy. So that is the worry for the world. So in this scenario, Dr. Panagria, where there is global trust deficit, and also there is distrust between United States of America and China. Uh, there is a growing, growing public opinion that India should get closer to the United States of America and chuck the uh, non-aligned foreign policy. Now that is big, building a lot of traction because I don't see personally, politically, it will be very easy. It will be very difficult for India, at least in the near term future, to build a relationship with China. Uh, which is friendly, which is equal, because uh, the, it will not allow uh, the public sentiment will not allow politicians to take that risk. Yeah, Taking yeah, into yeah. yeah, just talk to yeah, yeah. So Pradeep, uh, I, I, I am definitely not arguing for a strategic relationship with China. I am asking you with these many you know these many perspectives layers to it, and as you have suggested that uh, you know there will be mutual uh, uh, cost uh, when. when uh, we try to inflict trade sanction, sanctions. What is the way forward, Dr. Panagria? Yeah. What are we looking at? That is my uh, uh, yeah. point. No, I think that's 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 exactly the right right way to ask the question. So you know, look in international relations. Ultimately, each country is on its own. 
Yes. And each country has to look at its own national interest. Yes. And so should India. Uh, you know, after all, uh, 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 it is not very long ago that uh, India and the United States were on the opposite sides. And United States was very much helping Pakistan. And, and at that time, we saw our national interest uh, was served by being closer to Soviet Union. And we were closer to the Soviet Union. I think all that has changed in the last 20 years. Uh, I think since, since our nuclear tests and, uh, by Prime Minister Vajpayee, the, the international relation equation has, has changed. And now, of course, with you know, the China becoming so incredibly assertive all around, uh, that has changed even more. So where do we go? That is a very good question. That's the, way, that's the way I want to think of it. I think in the short run, I, I, I think we have to forge some sort of yet closer ties with what is being called the quad countries. So Japan, United States, and Australia. I'm not you know, an expert on international relations, so I can't say, or nor a military uh, uh, no. expert. So I, I won't say what form that, uh, you know, what form those close ties ought to take. But right now, I think our interests get aligned a lot better with the United States than with China international in terms of international relations. And uh, 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 therefore, I think we, we ought to cooperate with the United States. Uh, Actively, we really should not perhaps go out and start uh, ruffling the feathers in the trade relationship. At the moment, I will leave it alone. There are other issues of investment. For example, Huawei, do we need to make a decision? And that, I think, is a national security issue. Because the, if, if the fear is that, that, the, that, the, that the Chinese are going to put all kind of code in, in, in the equipment, which they will then later use to spy on us and so forth, then, of course, on national security grounds, you would basically say, sorry, not Huawei, even if we have to pay a higher price to Ericsson or somebody else. So, so some of those decisions, of course, you know, as they depending on how they bear on the directly on the national security, we'll have to take those decisions. But trade overall, I, I would not, you know, I mean, also, because I don't see that we, we, we can win big because it's also, I mean, China is an aggressive belligerent power. The United States is its larger, largest market by far. Even then it retaliated against the United States. So we do something, they will retaliate. So that, so now shorter term, I would build the relationships closer with quad countries, what form they take. I think I will leave it to the experts. On economic side is yes. where we need to focus to Absolutely. build up the ten trillion dollar economy, Correct. and there the policy ought to be also such that we gradually move ourselves away from China. Yes, because there remains to be problem there, and they, they probably will stay. So my own take there is that let us start forging free trade agreements with the like-minded developed countries developing also but 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 developed countries is a bigger challenge for us and let's try to do that and i think you know there are good prospects we can do these uh, free trade agreements certainly with the european union where the discussions have been ongoing for a long time uh, and we have made you know there are some demands being made on both sides which uh, the other side sort of resists but i think it can be done that will be a huge thing. I mean, the signal of that itself is huge. Now, Commerce Ministry, so, and I'll also do maybe with Canada, with Australia, uh, United Kingdom. Now the UK is out of the uh, uh, European Union. So UK is, is a separate country. I mean, you know, it's, it, there will have to be a separate agreement with the UK, uh, uh, not a separate country, but it's not a member anymore of the EU. Uh, now the United States. Well, I hear constantly this talk from the, the, the Commerce Ministry, oh, we are going to do this agreement with the United States. I mean, do it. That, that part it looks to me a little bit diversionary. I mean, it doesn't look to me that serious because mm -hmm. there are two major obstacles to an agreement, free trade agreement with the United States. One is US agriculture is highly competitive. Yes. Are we willing to open our agriculture? The U.S. will not sign an agreement with us unless we open our agriculture. Second, U.S. FTA template also has 
very strong disciplines on labor, environment, and intellectual property. Will we accept that template? Now, if the Commerce Ministry tells me today that yes, we are willing to, you know, we are willing to drop our past hesitations, and uh, we, we would, you know, negotiate on those issues, then I would put U.S. on the top of my list. Then I'll go first with the United States. But that's what we need to do: do a network of these free trade agreements with developed, like-minded developed countries, and of course, developing countries as well, which is lesser of a challenge. I think it will also send a huge signal to the global markets that India is serious. It is willing to deal with the big guys, and it will also then simultaneously help us bring all the multinationals that are fleeing China to India. I mean, you know, when they see that, look, you know, I can export products uh, from the Indian uh, soil uh, freely to European market, freely to Canadian market, hopefully freely to even the U.S. market, and 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 the rest. Uh, I, I think it become extremely attractive uh, 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 destination, uh, de attractive uh, 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 location for the multinationals. So that's how I would uh, uh, so, approach this. Yeah, Dr. Panagia, that's a very, very important point. So just to uh, uh, get it uh, correctly, if I've got it uh, correctly, you're saying that uh, the prerequisite towards uh, delinking ourselves, the process of delinking to uh, ourselves from China uh, should start, or in fact, I would say that an important pillar of that delinking process will be the ability of India to forge free trade agreements with like-minded developed countries or developing countries. If I got it correct, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. yeah. But not just developing. I mean, you yeah. know, you have to do uh, with, with the developed countries. That's what shows that you know. Yes, yes. We, we we are powerful nation. We are big nation. We are competitive nation. Uh, we are not afraid of signing agreements with uh, these countries. So that's the message we need to. Uh, so this is, uh, this is also, in addition to the market issue, there is also the message issue, signal yeah. issue. Yes. So the message is that we are self-confident, competitive, and willing to negotiate and engage with like-minded developed or developing countries, Absolutely. which ensures that our interest is also taken care of. Dr. Panakriya, I want to just dwell a bit further on China because you know that the talk of the town is China. Dr. Panakriya, it pains me as an individual, and I'll tell you this honestly from the bottom of my heart, it pains me as an individual that I see that China is ahead uh, from us economically because there was a juncture in history where all both of both our countries were you know at the same pace of economic development and China somehow overtook us. I want to understand from you Dr. Panagriya another point which I believe is that when I look at the fortune 500 list I see more than 100 Chinese companies in the fortune 500 okay fine that is a different issue that most of them do have uh, you know uh, people from the communist party of China uh, owning them indirectly but they have more than 100 companies. And when I look at the Indian side, I just have less than 10 Indian companies in Fortune 500. When I compare the per capita income of India and that to China, I see there's a difference. Dr. Panagri, I want to change this reality. Please guide the people of this country. You've been at the forefront of policy making. I will come to the nitty gritties of how far have we come, the package and all. But I want to understand from you, Dr. Panagri, how should we... When can I see that reality happening, Dr. Panagriya? You said the free team create agreements. What more should we do, Dr. Panagriya? Yeah, okay. No, I think, you know, uh, 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 I'm old enough to have been there uh, at the 1962 war also. Yes. So it, so you can see that it pains I me. I born at that time. It, it, I know you were not. <laughs> so, so you can see that it pains me even more. Uh, that this has happened. I mean, it has happened in front of my eyes. All of it has happened in front of my eyes. In fact, if you look at the data around 1980, India's per capita GDP actually was 10% higher than of China. So we were ahead of China at, at, at that time. And sadly, exactly what you describe has happened now. We let it happen. I think we let it happen because of our very bad policies. Uh, and we are still letting it happen, I have to say. Uh, after 1991, we began very well. We, you know, uh, two prime ministers did, did fantastic work. Uh, uh, prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, both, you know. And, and as a result of that, starting in 2003, we had started growing 8% plus. Uh, mm -hmm. It was on the back of those reforms. Uh, you know, UPA happened to be extremely lucky 
that he had won the 2004 election. And so it all looked like, you know, somehow it happened during the UPA era. Uh, yes. But once I, I asked a very, very senior uh, person in the UPA administration that name me five reforms that you guys did, which led to this growth. And apparently, I got no answer. I mean, you can go back. The, 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 your next book, who that person was? <laughs> uh, no, no. I mean, if you can, you can, you can go and check. This was at one of the India Today conclave. I think 2014 or somewhere there. Uh, 14, uh, I think 14, yeah, uh, uh, or 15 maybe. But you, know, so you can see that. I mean, it's there. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's public, uh, 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 publicly available. Um, uh, yeah. and, and, and so, but anyway, that's a side point. That, but the point is that, you know, then we lost almost 10 years under the UPA, particularly under UPA too. So many bad policies got made, you know. Uh, but even now, you know, we're not going fast enough. We, we need to, you know, many things we should have done yesterday need to be done tomorrow. Uh, but, but we need to. I mean, why are we not biting the bullet on labor law reforms? I mean, I think the prime minister certainly is keen to do it. Uh, it is the rest of his team which is failing on some of these issues. I mean, I was there and I know that, you know, and, and prime minister has taken such courageous decisions, uh, particularly in Modi 2.0. Uh, uh, and, you know, even in 1.0, in, 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 in the, the, uh, the, the insolvency in bankruptcy code, uh, the goods and services tax, and... I mean, after all, he did the demonetization as a part of his anti-corruption drive. There's a, there is an act of huge courage. So I don't think we are lacking in courage. And I know that, for example, you know, I've myself violated that uh, uh, National Medical uh, Commission Act. Uh, yes. it, was, it was voted finally in, in, in this term. But, you know, that was a very tough thing. Nobody wants to touch the doctors. They are so powerful. But he was willing to. He gave me full free hand. And so we, we, I was very deeply involved. And Niti Aayog then drafted that legislation. And, and he also helped us protect the main features of that legislation as we had drafted them. Uh, because obviously, the, the pressures came from various quarters to, to, to weaken it. Uh, but, but he allowed us. You know, so I think prime minister is not like, but you know, ministries have to do their job. Labor ministry has to, you know, rather than consult all the time the International Labor Organization. I mean, tell me, does the United States consult the International Labor Organization to write its labor laws? I mean, they would not let uh, the, the Labor Department in the U.S. will not let ILO staff anywhere near their uh, uh, department. But, you know, so, so we have to craft our own labor legislation based on the balancing of the rights of employees and employers. I mean, right now you have so much tilted the labor laws in favor of the existing employees and so much against the employers that employers no longer want to hire more workers. So just see what we are producing. Our mm -hmm. leading industries, just think about it. You know, I'll tell you what, what are our leading industries? Automobile protected by 125 percent tariffs, 125 percent tariffs. They are such a favored child for 70 years, you know. Uh, that they today give us the substandard cars at one and a half times the price at which they sell the same cars elsewhere in the world. Uh, um, uh, so, so you got auto, you got pharmaceuticals, you got the machinery, engineering goods, uh, you got information technology, you got petroleum refining. These are our big success stories. But hey, these are all capital intensive or skilled labor intensive industries. Not a single one that employs my workers with very limited skills. Work, you know, the industries that employ workers with limited skills, the kind of when we say skilling, of, you know, we skill workers and all so forth. Uh, those are workers, you know, coming from farming and coming from uh, uh, with, with limited education and so forth, high school maximally and all, uh, even in urban areas. Uh, for them, you have to have apparel industry, you have to have footwear industry, furniture industry, uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, kitchenware that we use, all kinds of uh, utility uh, things like umbrellas, uh, this, that, things that we use every day. Th th these are the things that China exports in very, particularly in 80s and 90s, and uh, China exported in very large volumes, very large volumes. Uh, that's how it provided employment. That's how it created the entire Shenzhen. I mean, Shenzhen today looks like, you know, it is a powerhouse for robots and the whole IT industry. 
but it 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 really was initially manufacturing uh, machinery it was a factory of the global economy that's where we are lacking and so we have limited capital you know because we are a labor abundant country it's largely yeah. our, our our big kind of factor of production is labor capital is somewhat limited but where are we doing we are putting this capital all in this very cap capital intensive industry which hardly employs workers and then very little capital is left for these other guys so they then have to pay very high interest rates on uh, borrowing this capital so and labor laws i mean that's one major factor it's not the only factor and and so this is the entire theme of my book you know the india unlimited uh, uh the, the, and, and and systematically it points out what are the major reforms we need to do so internally there's a lot of reforms to be done we need to open up the economy last 3 years we have been going in the wrong direction reverse this whole idea of import substitution which we had given up in 1991 and pursued that till recently you know when we opened up progressively until most of our tariffs except auto and textile industry came down to about 10% or less so it, up to by 2007 8 our top tariff rate except these auto and textiles and a few other industries were down to 10% now we have raised so many other tariffs so many of these tariffs back if we do that then we go back to the old bad days i mean in my days you know you could hardly import anything yes. and the product quality as a result suffered very poor product quality you know we I and mean, as as a student i remember we used to joke that you know is this a fountain pen or it's just a fountain <laughs> because you know the ink will flow so fast i mean not after then the ballpoint pens came in so there's a lot less of that issue but we used you know we 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 used to use these fountain pens you know so and similarly the our own domestic blades that we used to make to shave you know uh, it will take off your skin uh, but but once we opened up quality of our own products uh, i mean really got revolutionized i mean today we are producing world class quality so you won't remember all this you're so young yes but i remember these days i've lived through that and do we want to do similar things again this import substitution and so forth produce for the global market be competitive that's where you know i mean think of it that if 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 sachin tendulkar first said ki are bhai pehle to ranji trophy khelo thoda sa tab you know home ground pe sikho सीधा जाके टेस्ट में नहीं नहीं कम्पीट कर सकते थोड़े बीस साल तक इन सब बच्चों को हम रणजी ट्रॉफी या स्कूल क्रिकेट में सिखाते हैं एंड देन यू नो आफ्टर ट्वेंटी इयर्स वील गो एंड प्ले टेस्ट क्रिकेट डू यू थिंक वील एवर गेट दीज वर्ल्ड क्लास प्लेयर्स आई मीन सम यू विल गेट बिकॉज द प्लेयर्स कैन बी सो इनक्रेडिबली टैलेंटेड i mean you know uh, some people are born with the talent so you, but if you are talking about large number you know half dozen or or 10 cricket players of world class uh, level every year hmm. that is not going to happen unless you are playing test cricket yes and and it's the same for you know products you know you have to compete in the global economy dr panavia uh, so uh, the message is simple from your side that we need to uh bite the bullet on labor and uh, i think you are absolutely correct that the only individuals dr panavia let me with my opinion who benefited from these uh, labor reforms not happening are not even the laborers but it is more these uh, fringe i would say labor unions yes. who have uh, you know amassed huge amount of wealth particularly these uh, you know extreme left fringes where because till the time the uh, the company does not grow the intensive industries do not grow how will the labor benefit absolutely so even seeing the per capita the income the wages of the laborers have not increased in an exponential rate as it had to and if i was comparing the rate of increase of wages in india to that of china china in fact the wages have increased so the laborers themselves have not benefited absolutely i think you said it i mean it's in a sense you know the, the basic economics is not rocket science so what you're saying exactly you say uh, 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 and you see the transformation requires you know one of the things we need to understand so this is the gets to the political economy side of this that we need to understand that the transformation requires going from rural agricultural economy to industrial uh, urban economy that's what is what a transformation is all about i mean you hmm. think about you know south korea i mean that's my favorite example look at 1965 around almost 70% of the uh, workforce in south korea was in agriculture Mm. today they are down to 5% you see 
but but what we are doing is we are trying to say and even in the recent context of migrant workers and so forth we are trying to say you know you stay where you are hmm. keep doing farming now think about it how do you make them prosperous we have done great agricultural reforms in this uh, atmanirbhar bharat package the the finance minister announced have come to atmanirbhar yes yeah, yeah. But, but but wait but but my context here is that so these are these are reforms that i have been writing for 20 years now and a lot of others are also so i'm not the only one uh, great courage act of courage finally we have done it but my question still remains 70 million agricultural holdings today 70 million which are 50% half I mean 48% so about half roughly half of these agricultural holdings in india are less than half hectare yes and the average size is less than a quarter hectare Yes. Right, you know, so you know, when we say half, less than half hectare, some are, some may be half hectare, but then some are 0.1 hectare. So average out, you get about 0.23 hectare. Now the value added that is generated on these uh, holdings is so small. You can double farmers' income. You can even triple it. It's not going to get them very far. They just cannot get very far. And there's a very large number of farmers because 70 million. Hector, this is you know, sorry, seventy million holdings. Yes, and that's that's just I I drew the line at at you know less than half hectare. If you go to two hectare, which is also small, eighty six percent are below that. So how are you going to make them prosperous? You can double it, you can even triple it. They don't become prosperous. Maybe they'll come out of poverty, but they don't become prosperous. You need to do what South Korea did: get them out of there. into industry and services so that's your one problem but you have a problem similar one similar problem of smallness you got in industry also industry and services your companies are tiny little very tiny yeah. little companies. yes i'm i was coming to that dr panagriya i think you I, i i was coming to that and that is why my next question is dr panagriya the, the fact that we have majority of our companies as either small micro or medium and most of our farm holdings as less than 86 percentage of your farm holdings less than 2 hectare and i've been traveling across the country and i see this and most of these farmers are not engaged throughout 12 months even in their farm land so it's mostly if sub if i go to chatisgarh i will see only rice as the major crop which is you know uh, uh, sowed throughout the year and you will have at least 6 months of uh, free time for these people so these people then do casual work so i am with you on this dr panagriya but there is one question dr panagriya on this particular topic that after the way the, uh, uh, after the covid pandemic took place and the migrant workers had to go back to their villages now i've been speaking to these migrant workers across the country in my travel and what i gather dr panagriya uh, you know the uh, whole dream of choosing prosperity and going back to the cities they might have they might suffer back how do you look at this in the covid world and then i want to go to the specific but this is a question which i really need an answer to pradeep let me give you the counter example here yes and this was on the news you know i read the same news that you do i mean you travel also around i mean which i don't get to do from here <laughs> but but i read in haryana uh while they were still kind of you know transporting the the uh, the uh, migrant workers back to their homes then we got uh, it it was a long drawn process so yes. we they got to the point that the economy was already opening up yes. so there was a train to leave carrying these migrants to i think up or bihar mm. about some you know 2000 or some some very large number had registered actually to to go Mm. only 600 showed up mm. because they figured that this is opening up yes. and and now there was a wage premium because some had already left so yes. so so there there was a worker shortage so there's a premium to, on wages just wait another 6 months all the workers who said ki i would rather stay here for uh, a, a, a less prosperous life uh, um, just wait another 6 months you, they will all be back uh, where 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 they were uh it, it it's simply that right now the 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 threat from covid still remains look i mean yeah. i'm not going you know when i was given the option for the fall semester would you teach online or you teach in classes uh at my age i chose i'll rather do it online uh so there is a fear 
uh, uh, but you know, let a, a vaccine come through, let and and you'll see. You know, I, I mean, I, I I think migrants are the most ambitious people. Yes, they they they, they look for uh, uh, opportunities. They yes. look for a better life, and yes. they will come. I mean, I I am very influenced by my own story, meaning not more not my story. I my, I, I my in, father's story. I'm so in, uh, taken by my father's story. When my father was born in complete poverty, they could hardly not even get two meals a day. Uh, he lost his father at four, mother at fourteen, uh, and yet he managed to acquire some education. Great kind of foresight of my grandmother. And and landed in Jaipur at around around 25, 26 years of age. So once he landed in Jaipur, for me, from Jaipur to New York was not a very difficult journey. No, Dr. Banagriya, let me, I am absolutely in consonance with you that migrants and in fact, every person in this country is an ambitious individual and uh, they will find their means and it is just about opportunity. I am absolutely in agreement with you. And let me tell you at outset, Dr. Banagriya, this is my personal wish that I really want to see and we all want to see India as a wealthy nation because till now I have seen that the socialists and Nehruvians have somehow, uh, you know, made uh, uh, wealth, have, have looked down on wealth. And that has been the politics in this country that somebody who's wealthy has been looked down to. And I think this has to change because till the time we do not grow wealthy as a nation, we will not prosper as you are saying. But Dr. Panagriya, that are thoughts and you said it absolutely correctly. Let me get to a specific Dr. Panagriya. And now I'm getting in my flow. 20 lakh crore uh, um, Atmanirbhar Bharat package the government has announced. And you have been at the forefront of reforms. My response to you, uh, my question to you, beg your pardon, is Dr. Panagriya. The critics say that large portion of this is in form of loan. And the recent data which has come out is say that the loan growth in India is not as high as it has to. And the Manrega wages are saving the people at that time. This is something which has come out in the newspapers. How do you look at that is my point number one, Dr. Panagriya. And uh, uh, just a question, uh, just a response from that first and then I'll take it. Yeah, I, I have generally taken the view that this was a well-designed package yes. uh, because during COVID, demand shock had been there and supply shock was also there until you right. get the hands uh, to the machines or, you know, un until people can start working, uh, stimulating demand on its own cannot generate a supply response. Yes. Supply response requires the workers to be working. Right. So, yes. so, so I think the major problem during COVID, uh, uh, which uh, still continues in places like Bombay and 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 or Mumbai yes. and Delhi, uh, and a few other cities, uh, was to ensure that everybody, you know, had the means to survive. Uh, you you need to needed to feed them. You need to provide them shelter, uh, and that's what the package tried to do. The first part of the package, you know, soon after the twenty fourth March speech by the Prime Minister that 1.7 lakh crore package. Uh, that was the main purpose. And, and, and I think it, it rightly focused on that. On that. Now, the other side of the COVID was that for the firms, for the companies, enterprises that were otherwise viable uh, and solvent uh, should not go under because cash flow has start, stopped. You know, nobody was generating revenues. How do you pay wages and how do you, you know, and particularly when you come out of COVID, suddenly you have all this. So. I think the package therefore rightly also focused on the loans and so forth. Now you are right that I have also read these reports that uh, that loans uh, uh, that, that the credit has not expanded rapidly enough. And so uh, 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 now it's I don't think it's for the lack of the government effort, meaning that there is a three lakh crore uh, loans that the government has fully guaranteed that even principal and interest will be. Uh, covered by the government. So there's a full 100% guarantee on that credit. Even then, the banks simply have not succeeded uh, in, in, uh, in expanding the credit very fast. So there's clearly demand issue here. And, and the enterprises, for some reason, are, are, are not borrowing as, as much as uh, you would expect uh, in, in a situation like this. So not sure what exactly the solution is. 
but the government has to stay ready there you know because we may see some bankruptcies and so forth and and so that that's something to worry about and right. and this problem for us is a gets bigger one when once we recognize that we went into the crisis with very mm. stressed uh, financial so. sector the financial mm. sector was already under severe stress i mean mm. in the end i think you know it was a mistake uh, it was a recognized mistake but somehow the government didn't move fast enough uh, npas to me was clear to uh, late late 2013 to early 14 that we these then all these restructured loans that uh, banks were reporting were going to turn into npas uh, uh, and at least i pushed very hard when i was there that to move faster but uh, uh, ultimately the responsibility was between the reserve bank of india and the department of financial services neither of which showed a great deal of enthusiasm to begin solving the problem so only when urjit patel actually became rbi governor credit collapsed completely credit growth you know early 2017 yes credit growth had collapsed completely completely yes and the data were very clear that's when in fact the order really came pretty much from the top and then mm-hmm. the dfs began to move and and of course rbi was by that time urjit patel was the uh, governor who was very keen actually to 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 get to it so Sorry. before urjit patel the delay in uh, uh, the rbi's uh, you know uh, uh, i would say the delay by the rbi to not ensure that the credit growth happens and not to uh, see the uh, loans which might turn npas has costed us do you say that yes very much no both i mean the responsibility is with both dfs also department of financial services also uh, yes. but those were the two big actors who needed to who who needed to act at the time but the rbi talked all about this you know different kinds of i call this alphabet soup you know s4a and uh, sdr uh, yes. and all these different alternative uh, schemes of restructuring uh, were, were being 525 scheme and so forth uh but that that's there was neither here nor there you know you needed to get going with cleaning up process dr panagri is uh, uh, because the re- recent credit growth uh, because the government i am absolutely uh, in agreement that the government's quantum of uh, package announced at least in terms of loan growth is substantial but the uh, alacrity of people to uh, of the banks particularly to give loan is not uh, as it has to be is that because that the banks fear that these loans which they are giving in the time of covid will eventually turn out to be npas and then it will hurt their balance sheets but you see the at least the the the, the 3 lakh crore part of mm-hmm. it for msmes yes that's principal uh, and uh, um, uh, and interest is guaranteed now there yes. may be other fine print on this which i may not be you know so, so it's possible that probably not everybody can b- borrow from that particular pot uh and it and the banks probably are you know there are some limits uh, how much they can borrow each firm and so forth so there may be some limits but but that pot certainly is 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 guaranteed so so there the problem is on the demand side i think not on the supply side uh, uh and uh, you can speak to the state bank of india and so forth i mean i've talked you know he's been on one of the shows uh where the chairman of the state bank of india was saying that you know we are very open to business and so forth so i mean you know but but uh, he probably could answer better uh, wh- why credit is not expanding as fast as as uh, uh, sure. uh, it should you know because the, the government has guaranteed 3 uh, uh, lakh crore um there may be other issues you know but and some of the by the way also there is one problem when people think you know that we got too many companies too many you know enterprises 63 million or something like some you know 60 million plus enterprises and this is a five year old uh, uh, number uh, i mean us is you know uh, what uh, about 10 times the indian economy or something yes. close yes they they have only one third of those enterprises this just goes back to this smallness issue that you know yes. too many uh, these very hand to mouth and and there the banks can't reach you see they they small little you know enterprises which are self employed basically they employ their uh, uh, mom and pop shops as we will call them in the us uh, they don't have any access to the bank credit you know so so they they survive on the daily revenues so for yes. them actually life is much tougher and this is all goes back to this is why you need a much more formalized structure of the economy and this is why you need medium and large enterprises to become you know we talk micro small and medium 
there is no medium in india you know if you look at medium size firms they don't account for even 5% of employment in in india the medium is missing we only keep talking about the first m micro yes. but you need the medium to come in and the large to come in uh, dr panagria uh, i you written a very fantastic book india unlimited Reco uh, you know reclaiming the lost glory i want to ask you uh, first of all uh you enlisted a lot of reforms and in fact there was a joke that you know the uh, you had the uh, lendiest review uh, which people have seen in the recent past of a book in a newspaper so if people could not catch your book they could read the uh, review because people were so fascinated <laughs> that was my tweet <laughs> <laughs> so I want to. I said no, those. Yeah, I mean, I, I was saying that you know the, the, those not with the, the strong enough heart to read a long book, to read yes. a thick book. I think is what I, I said. You know, I have researched yes, read this review. Yes. <laughs> so um, my question to you is that what are the reforms as per the book which have the government has taken, uh, you know, already uh, implemented, and what are the reforms that need to be implemented at an urgent basis? And let me give you a context to it, Doctor Panagri. Why do I ask this? Because after covid i have seen that there is a great sensitivity in public opinion uh, with respect to health and health was no longer you know in the past was not a political issue or a issue to gather votes but i see that people are extremely conscious about it and india has uh, historically spent less than 2 percentage of its gdp on health and less than 4 percentage of its gdp on education now free market uh, votaries and you've been a free uh, also uh, i would say uh, one of them at least in the essence of it have said that the government should be out of business now i want to ask you what are the reforms uh the government has done uh, which you have enlisted in the as per your book or as per your reading what are the top 5 reforms that the government has done and what are the five reforms we should urgently take in the next one year so okay i'm glad you said at least said five because sometimes people say two or something because reforms is a continuous process you yes. you, you know i am not one of those believe that you do two things and things will suddenly you will become a 8% growth economy you don't uh no i mean uh, again when you ask the question uh, are you referring to the modi era reforms or uh, modi era okay so so i would say uh, the big ones uh, uh, under prime minister modi uh, um, most definitely i'll put first and foremost the 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 insolvency in bankruptcy code is a big one i've been writing for at least 15 years on that um second goods and services tax gst no doubt about it uh third the knocking down of the corporate profit tax to uh, now for the new manufacturing firms it's to 17% and for everybody around 25 or so that's fantastic three um uh, for the entire stuff we did around the dbt very big one very big that, one dr panagri in fact let sorry to interject you even when i travel on the ground one thing which i have seen has worked fascinatingly well has been the dbt part and uh, i have come across like every third village where i have seen beneficiaries benefiting because of direct benefit reaching their account sorry absolutely. just please yeah. no no absolutely and also what the you know prime minister calls the ease of living yes there, certainly you know i talk to my own relatives and so forth you know so uh, 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 a lot of things for which they have to go and send in lines in queues Uh, they no longer have to do you know you can simply download things and so forth so so big big uh, progress there and 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 it has huge i mean the whole uh, you know when i say dbt i'm talking of the entire digital platform uh, that has been created including the upi you know the the uh, uh, our um, uh, the, the unified payments uh, interface for a fantastic yeah. platform you know so Uh, uh, incredibly impressive so those are the, so all the whole digital uh, stuff and all sure. uh, and fifth if you want me i'll probably put the agricultural reforms these were greatly overdue e even though as i said you know in, at the end of the day that's not going to deliver uh, uh, prosperity for very large part of the uh, farm population but these were very important reforms for modernization of agriculture agricultural marketing and so so i would say that, that, that those are the five i would put there are many others have been done in in the world yeah. very recently some fantastic stuff done on coal you know in coal yes. when i left and and this was one of the last things on which i had uh, uh, you know big meeting at the prime ministers and we talked about you know the whole energy national energy policy which we were writing at the time 
Uh, and uh, my sort of line on that was that, you know, this is one sector which still is operating under the complete license permit Raj uh, uh, policy uh, with all the features of that uh, command and control system. So now we have recently uh, opened up coal sector to, uh, uh, you know, commercial mining. And, and that was such an obvious thing to do. But luckily, you know, the coal secretary uh, was our uh, 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 head of our uh, uh, energy vertical. Now, you know, the Anil Jain, uh, who is the coal secretary now, uh, he was at Niti Aayog. And so he was the one, you know, I, mean, uh, I was only uh, providing uh, some economists uh, inputs to him at the time. But he was really sort of helping, right? They, he was the one writing the energy, national energy policy. So he's now become coal secretary. So bang, you know, things. <laughs> so so I, I'd been uh, successful to influence his thinking to some degree. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he's gone in and done that. So, I mean, that's another. But now come to the future, right? You yeah. know, what, 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 what to be done. So uh, I've already indicated uh, at least two things, right? You know, I've talked about the, the FTAs we need to do. But around FTAs, we just need to do a lot more liberalization, knock down tariffs to uh, about, you know, I said, bring it down to about average of 7% or so. Uh, not only average, but you know, just get all, all products, just put a 7% tariff, try to bring that down, compress, 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 bring everything down to 7%. Mm -hmm. So uh, seven is not the, in any sense the magic number. You can do eight or you can do six. I mean, but I'm just yeah. using some, some rough number. Basically, low tariffs, low low protection. So that, all that is part of opening up. So opening up, opening up, and and we also need a lot of trade facilitation, which which means you know that the uh, uh, the ships have to turn around, turn around fast when goods come in. They have to be able to you know the importers are able to should be able to quickly move their goods out of the ports and onto uh, wherever they need to go. Exports likewise have to move fast. So this is the whole area is called trade facilitation and all. So. All these different issues related to trade, to, to opening up of the trade. Okay. Mm. One, uh, two, uh, labor, extremely important. Three, we need to do a whole lot on land. Mm. Now, companies have to be built on land. You can't do it without land. And in India, one of the big problems is that land titles are not well defined. Yes. You see, so anytime you want to put up a big factory requiring, let's say, you know, 100 acres of land, it's very difficult because 100 acre land pieces singly owned don't exist. You have to, you know, pool a lot of smaller pieces to create the big one. Now, what happens is that often there are pieces of land on which all kinds of encumbrances. And so the titles are not clear. You can't, you know, so you can't do it. So that's where the government has to come in and at least, you know, they, much of it, maybe the private guys can buy, but there are some pieces that are in the middle because you need a contiguous piece of 100 acre land. Uh, government has to be able to acquire it for the industry, that part, at least some pieces of that. So that sort of thing. So that requires some uh, change in the Land Acquisition Act also. But more generally, I think, you know, what, what we land prices in India are incredibly high. They're just too high. And I, I have a whole chapter on urbanization and, and bulk of that focuses on what we need to do on land. Because there's a lot of unused land in the urban areas for all sorts of reasons. You know, there was the Urban Land Ceilings Act. So a lot of land is tied up because of that. A lot of land is owned by the public sector enterprises. Uh, uh, they use only 5% or 10% of the land that they have. 90% is unused, that needs to come back on the market. Defense ministry, railway ministry, aviation ministry, they all own a lot of land in the urban areas that needs to come onto the market. Um, even educational institutions look, you know, sit on very, sometimes sit on very, very large pieces of land, 200 acres, 300 acres kind of pieces of land, and it gets encroached. I mean, they're not even able to, con to, to secure it properly. So, you know, bring it on the market. Uh, you know, you can give the institution the money, you know, whatever you sell for, you can give them the money. So, um, are we on? Yes, sir, we okay. are on. I'm listening to you. Okay. So, so uh, um, uh, 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 land is, is another very, very big one. Okay. And, and in urbanization, I'll take that also that you need to create uh, uh, this, this low rent, 
hmm. urban housing you know we yeah. have focused uh, our pmay and all you know uh, the, the the prime minister's uh, avas yojana that yeah. focuses on giving low low cost housing to people Correct. but that's that only aims at the people who are there yes but the migrants are discouraged you know they can't find housing so then they go and find places in slums yes but you know uh, that's not uh, 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 what you want to encourage so you need to create low rental housing and 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 you have to have an ecosystem in which uh, uh, a, a commercial low rent housing can flourish because the government can't do everything True. but but if but right now because of the very high prices of land and part of the problem is you know the, the conversion of agricultural land into you know on every city on its periphery has agricultural land agriculture which you know should be allowed to be converted you know even most of the farmers would actually be happy if you convert it then it becomes very valuable farmer gets a very good price for it they are much more willing then to 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 part with that land yes. at that high price so yes. but what is happening is that you know you you have put that right to convert the land to revenue departments in the states mm -hmm. and revenue departments don't want to convert mm -hmm. so give it to the urban you know whoever deals with urbanization deal, give that power to the urban authority you know authorities that uh, uh, look after the cities yes and 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 so the conversion land conversion laws that will also help so so right now the rental yields are extremely low in bombay they are down to 1 to 2% now with the interest rate that you have to pay 8 to 10% that's unprofitable there is no way the commercial uh, you know uh, uh, rental housing can come in so we need to do fix that so anyway this is all land related issues yes. yeah right? third fourth so i've given you three fourth uh, uh, we need to fix the education system both school and higher education yeah uh, dr panang if you can elaborate on the education part a bit because there have been a lot of public questions asking you on education and health because somehow we've given this to the private players and which have seen this uh, you know disproportionate increase in fee and uh, uh, even in the healthcare Uh, uh, we have uh, seen mushrooming of uh, private healthcare. I have no problems with that. But my question and my principle is that at the end of the day, in this country, you should have affordable, quality healthcare available to each and every person. So, uh, how do you look at education and health, uh, Doctor Panagia? Okay, so on education, um, you see, education and health both are public goods. So economists, yeah. you know, so so economists have no problem saying that the government. Uh, should uh, uh, do something about those yeah. um uh, but the experience that has been you know you are telling me about uh, private education you know and private guys um, selling it very expensive and so forth no that's not true actually you know there's some schools probably that are expensive because you got some very wealthy people who can afford very high fees in fact the the uh, on average most private schools are way cheaper than the per pupil cost that we incur in the mm. public schools mm. you mean to the to the people it may mean you know to the particular family who is sending the child to public school it may it is free but somebody is paying for it and okay. that, and that's the taxpayer mm. and and the per pupil that we are spending in public education is scandalous mm. so let me just give you the perspective so sure. two thirds of our elementary public schools a okay, two thirds 68% to be exact these are 2017 18 figures hmm. 68% of our public elementary schools each of them has less than 100 kids hmm. on average they have only 45 kids and if i allow even let's say 20% absence of the kids on any given day which is very conservative actually rate of absenteeism of the students is a lot higher just do 20% that translates roughly with five classes let's say per school that translates into seven kids per class on any on an average day on That's these great. kids we are spending in public schools public elementary schools 39300 rupees 
per pupil in teacher salaries alone. 39th, does, any, does anybody spend in the, in the private sector, does anybody spend that kind of money on per pupil? I mean, some yeah. may be doing, you know, just uh, maybe don't school, etc. Where, where all our former rulers used to be uh, educated. Uh, but, uh, but most private schools don't charge that kind of fee. Mm. Now, that's scandalous. And that's not a small, you know, it's not happening in small pocket. This, these are your two thirds of the schools. One mm. third of the kids are in these schools or public, you know, public elementary schools. Mm. We are, you know, teacher salaries in public elementary schools are often three to five times the salaries, sometimes even seven times the salaries in the private schools. Because a lot of the private schools are budget schools. Mm. You know, a lot of these are in rural areas. Some mm. of them even teach under a tree. Mm. <laughs> so the kids go in and uh, get their midday meal in the public school and mm. they come to the, the, the private school under the tree. Uh, I mean, that's an extreme example I'm saying, but, 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 you know, in, in the, uh, even Delhi neighbors like Shradara, et cetera, these are not very, you know, these are very low budget schools, but the parents feel that, look, you know, I've got to educate the child. If, if the public school is not delivering, then they, they you know, everybody, parent knows, mm. talk to any parent, they know that, you know, any, if they've got any means to get to prosperity in the next generation, it is education. Absolutely. So, so therefore, they want to send them there. So, mm. frankly, our public education system is failing very, very badly. And all I, data I am giving you are not private. These are these are government data. You know, so all these numbers are. There is no dispute. I mean, it's not like Asar. Sometimes mm. when Pratham does these numbers, the government kind of disputes and all. So this, these are all government data. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and and across the board, including if you look at the government data, uh, the, the achievement levels in the public schools are lower than in private schools. So when you look for cost uh, per pupil for any given level of education, we are uh, poor taxpayer is really paying uh, a very high price in the public schools. So that's where I come from. So, so what, what I mean, you know, if we, if, if we could really if the public sector could actually provide good education, oh, by all means do it. I have no problem. But mm. one time actually, you know, in my own staff at Niti Ayo, because mm. I was alone on one side and the whole staff was on the other side saying that, oh no, government has to provide education because that's a public good and et cetera, et cetera. So I said, okay, raise your hand. How many of you send your children to public schools? Now, mind you, these are central government employees. Mm. They can they can generally get, get access to the the CBSC and so you know the the Kendri yeah. Vidyalaya and and even there's one another category for schools which are even better uh, mm. government run central government run uh, but they all not a single hand went up not a single hand went up mm. they were all sending their children to private schools yeah so the, my point is this that give the parents the choice let parents choose. So whatever you are spending in the public school per pupil, mm -hmm. tell the parent either you can send the child to public school or you can take this much money and go wherever you want to go. I mean, in a way, just give them the money and say, go wherever you go. So if he comes way to forward, Dr. Panagya. What's Sorry? the way forward, in short? What's the way forward? Are you suggesting so that's, that? forward. that's one way forward that okay. look, you know, uh, at least what you are spending in teacher salaries per pupil. Mm -hmm. Give that to the, I mean, that's one way to, 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 to the pupil, I meaning to the family of the pupil. Hmm. If they choose public school, the money will come back. So it's a voucher. You give them a voucher, which, 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 will, be okay. which will be convertible into, in, into money. And if the voucher goes back to the public school, public school will recover it. Uh, if it goes to private school, then private school will recover it. That forces competition on the public school. Compete with the, you know, if you can do well. That's one. Another way, if you want to do it, at least that's a lesser reform, but at least make the what you pay to the school dependent on the number of children in school. OK, uh, you know, today, what we do is we say teacher salary, yeah. the government is going to pay because they are they, they, they are employees of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like the Sarkari employees, more or less. 
Hmm. So we pay the teacher salaries, but so, that's not the way. Hold yeah. the school responsible. If you yeah. lose kids, you also lose my money. You yeah. Know, yeah. Why is the taxpayer right? I mean, I I feel so strongly about this because taxpayers' money. For viewers, like, you know. Yes, Dr. Panigre, please come teach. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'll say, I mean, it's not like uh, the, 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 the government is uh, harvesting money from somewhere. The, the money is coming from the taxpayer. We are taking from the uh, pocket of Ram and giving it to Sham. So, uh, there, uh, and there may be, there are very good reasons why you should do that. And, and but uh, uh, at the same time, then, you know, the value of uh, the money, once it goes to the pocket of Sham, should produce more than what it would have produced for Ram. Well, uh, Dr. Panagriya, that requires a very in detail discussion. So uh, this is, I'd ask because the public uh, sent, you know, a lot of people were asking your question on health and education, but I think that will require another interview. My last question to you, because health and education is something which I really want to go a lot in depth, particularly because looking at what the Delhi government has done and also on labor, I want to go a bit in depth, but I'm running out of time because what UP and Madhya Pradesh has done in labor reforms, so just if you can give me a very quick comment, are you happy just in yes or no? Are you happy with what the UP government has done with this or the MP government has done on the labor reforms? Or uh, is it absolutely in favor of the employers and not taking into consideration? Yeah. No, I think that, that, yeah. So the contrast is between UP plus UP or Gujarat, which have done more or less the same thing. Yeah. Versus MP. Yes. Uh, so no, actually UP and uh, Gujarat did not do the hard work. No, they haven't that reform. You see, it's a concurrent list uh, subject. Mm -hmm. Labor is a concurrent list subject. Mm -hmm. So they can only request the central government to allow the reform. So they pass these ordinances and sent to the central government. I am hundred percent sure that the central government will deny them mm. because because, because uh, they did not do the hard work. They should have done harder work and amended the specific laws that yes. needed amendment. If you do say you that after thirty laws I will allow uh, thirty three laws I will just allow three and not other thirty, uh, that's not on. I mean you know. You, 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 oh. Doctor yeah. Panaki, I am sorry to interject you. I want to ask the last question. Because, uh, you know, this interview, uh, as you know, because you're a deep thinker, uh, uh, if we go on, it will be hours and hours and people will be so enlightened with your views. But my last question to you is because I'm running out of time and uh, this is what I had to ask in my research. Dr. Panagriya, you had worked very, very closely with the Prime Minister. And uh, but I want to understand from you and uh, how is this, how... Would you see the prime minister in this situation? Like I know you have come back to the United States of America. A lot of people, uh, let me tell you, Dr. Panagri, I'm wanting you to come back to India and wonder why have you gone to the United States? We miss you in India. But we, I want to understand from you, what is prime minister's way of thinking? Is he looking at, because what I see, Dr. Panagri, there are two people who are extremely poor who get the benefit from the government in terms of social transformation, the benefit, direct benefits, it is the government schemes which you know aid them in order to live, ease of living which you're talking about. Then you have the rich, uh, the rich class. There is a very small, big section of the mobile class which is not poor, which is neither rich, which is you know uh, the aspirational class which wants to get rich and is not poor. My question to you, Dr. Panari, how does the Prime Minister look at the economy? Is he looking at increasing the per capita income? How is the Prime Minister would be thinking at this moment where so much is going on in this country with the India-China standoff, where the economy has to be brought back to double-digit growth or at least 7 to 8 percentage? We have so much of unpredictability. You have COVID. What will be the Prime Minister thinking? You are the man who worked very closely. <laughs> No, no, I think you know it's very difficult to summarize in a short uh, summarize him in a, in a in a short statement. Basically, my view, uh, uh, the, the way I understood the prime minister is that he's a holistic person. Uh, you know, so so he doesn't think only in parts. So and and that applies in a way across the board. So uh, uh, for example, India as a whole regionally, he likes to think you know what is happening to my northeast, what is happening to Bihar, what is you know so region wise holistic. Sector-wise, also he tends to be much more holistic, uh, uh, and and certainly, of course, you know he very much wants the growth to 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 be uh, in the eight to ten percent range. There is no doubt that. Um, uh, uh, so that's that's roughly how how I would summarize that he's holistic and he's decisive, uh, uh, he's courageous, and he likes to do things on scale. That is also, except you know somehow he is not focused on scale in industry and services. I mean, on the private sector scale. 
but in his own he does things on scale look at jandhan look at the aadhar you look at the uh, the the the, the uh, swachh bharat mission uh, and now he has announced it's all uh, piped water to everybody by 2024 ambitious very ambitious and 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 he managed to get it done i mean swachh bharat i thought would never happen but boy it got that transformative swachh bharat has been extremely transformative when it has changed people's behavioral attributes and it could not have been possible if the prime minister would not have done it from the right the top any person is still with the prime minister which you remember which you want to share you know anything which uh, uh, is indicative which people want to know <laughs> no no he is very kind to me so you know the, uh, he uh, you, you, you can look up uh, the, 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 there might be a video somewhere you know he said very nice things that uh, when i uh, uh, and totally completely unexpected because jo niti ayog uh, this was maybe less than a week before uh, just a few days before uh, i was leaving uh, and we had organized a program for him these are the champions of change i think it was called where all the it mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know younger younger it people had been invited so mm-hmm. quite a large number of them and suddenly in his speech towards the end you know the five minute beautiful speech where he uh, uh, said some very nice things about me so i thought that was really a very moving uh, moment for me also for my wife so uh, so that was really very 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 nice uh, but i no. could also tell you one uh, if you have one just half minute um, yes one, one of the things is not so much with the prime minister but uh, on my last day or day before that um, uh, what what really sort of uh, to me felt like yeah, okay i i i i have really done something good here uh, uh, we had gone a friend had invited us you know these these are uh, uh, farewell dinners that friends were giving so we'd gone to the iic and uh, then we came back out and we were waiting for the car and all so the lady was standing a little far away so she walked back around and then came near me and then says that uh, you know um, uh, uh, you don't know who i am but i know who you are and you really gave us hope and both my children uh, uh, absolutely uh, 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 admire you very much so i this was almost on the last day or day before and i thought well that's there could not have been a better ending uh, to to um, you know are you, uh, are you planning to come back ah uh, no i think we are not here <laughs> see uh, for us that i mean the, the, uh, you, you asked you know the the, uh, the press wrote all kinds of silly things you know because they they just love to to speculate and all but it was simply that uh, 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 the columbia would have never given me leave for uh, you know completing my term which would have required at least 4 years of, because yeah, you know i was appointed almost after a year uh, of of 2014 may they came january 15 is when i was appointed so i would have needed four years of leave to complete that full term mm. and uh, no i will league university has uh, does gives leaves for you know that long i mean uh, the the classic case is of henry kissinger uh, mm. and uh, 1971 he came to work with nixon and 73 he had to resign from harvard so he came from harvard and uh, they didn't extend his leave uh, and he was a major figure at the time you know <laughs> uh, so i i think us universities tend to be very very uh, uh, okay about long you know anything longer than 2 years uh, and uh, we all have uh, you know and then we were also paying very high rent here you know because i didn't want to leave my apartment from where we are talking today mm. so for uh, that period almost 3 years we paid the rent without any income <laughs> because the income from my the government salary was like 50000 rupees or something of my salary you know it was that i was in the minister salary which mm. is, which is usually like something like 50000 plus maybe 2000 rupees uh, uh so it's not dollars it's 50000 rupees plus some 2000 rupees they give per day of allowance so it's not <laughs> so so we are basically you know paying here almost 4 and 1/2000 dollars in uh, rent for this apartment from where i'm speaking uh because if 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 i give that up then then i w- won't be able to get it this is uh... <laughs> well mr panagria dr panagria i let me tell you that people here really want you to be back and they want you to you know you've served the country and your articles are extremely instructive they ponder a lot of thinking and thought in the way the macro economic and the micro economic policy should be designed and i think in the best part of this interview has been that we've tried to touch all the possible aspects 
where people want you to speak on, particularly on China and the reforms that you really want this government to look forward to. And we do hope, Dr. Panagriya, that uh, before the next conversation, whenever that happens, or uh, we see that the growth starts picking up back. And I want to see a day, Dr. Panagriya, this is my personal wish, and I know we share this wish where we overtake China in terms of... Our Absolutely. Country. That should be our national mission. And we need you for that national mission. Let me tell you that, Dr. Panak. No, no, I'm a participant in that mission. Don't worry. Just because you know, I'm living in a different place means nothing. I mean, after all, within India also, you can't live uh, uh, everywhere. I mean, you have to choose one place. So, sure. So you, you, you can do it from Bombay. I can do it from New York. And so, you know, things we do are not very different. Uh, uh, it's simple. Thank you, Dr. Panagre. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Panagre. It's been an honor to speak to you because this has been a uh, learning, you know, a very thought provoking conversation for me. It's not been like those usual political conversations. India is a very it's inspiring place. You must have experienced yourself. You are a bullish man and so am I. And let's do hope, Dr. Panagde, that all of us take our country forward. You've been an inspiration for a lot of economic thinkers and people have loved this. And right now we are staring at, let me tell you, 12.26 a.m. Uh, Indian time. So we have started our conversation yesterday and we uh, yeah. ended up in the next day. <laughs> so thank you so much, Dr. Panagde. Take care of your Thanks a lot. You, you too, Pradeep. And do very well. You, 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 you do this very, very well, I must say, you know. This is an art, huh? so uh, carrying on the conversation is not so easy. So yes. if, if I have to do what you are doing, uh, yes. I, I would be complete failure. <laughs> I don't think so, Dr. Panagi. You can try that. Thank you so much, sir. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Lovely. Lovely, Pradeep. Bye. Bye.